Okay, this is a question uh, to any of you who would like to, to answer. What are the methodologies and pedagogical practices by which we learn and practice the principles of a society of free and responsible people? This is when the non-academics look at the PhDs and go, hey, you got that whole <laughs> pedagogy thing, it's all you. <laughs> yep, that's called passing the buck. Well, it is interesting that I think none of us are actually teaching at a university at the moment. So um, Thor had some great insights, I think, about current pedagogies and how they've drifted. And um, I, I talked about institutional drift, and I, I think that this is a great question. And I think that the author of the question should, you know, come join us and talk about how we get back to this kind of a, a serious considera consideration of pedagogy. Um, Thor, I think that the conversation that you just gave us about the, um, the conversations taking place in the United States with um, around the academic principles and principles of freedom is a great first start. It's kind of a co-creation. Whether it's enough to salvage American universities, I don't know, but at least it's a practice of engaging together around ideas and principles again, which has been sorely absent. So I think maybe we start there. Well, I mean, to think that, uh, that a, universe, a university would actually have to do that is kind of like, well, that's a little strange. We have to reiterate the importance of open debate and discussion. How is that even, how is that even possible? That they have actually become totalitarian institutions. It's insane. It's, it's very, very odd. I kind of sold that short in 2005. I think that they are mostly irredeemable. And I think the idea that the market is going to fix them is absolutely ludicrous. I absolutely think the market is not going to fix the problem. You have completely wrong incentives. People go to university because they want a degree and they want the prestige of a degree, not for an education. Overwhelmingly, parents want their kids to go to Ivy League schools. They want their kids to go to the top schools because that will guarantee that they will get a job. For years, I heard so many donors, so many parents say, when confronted with what was going on in universities, with what they were being taught inside the classroom and primarily outside the classroom, the here, the people would say, it's just going to wash off them like washing off a duck's back. When they graduate and they get into the real world, all that crap that they're being fed, it's all just going to wash off. Guess what? It didn't wash off. And all of those, all of those former kids are now middle management at all major institutions. They're all at Twitter. They're all, and from the best universities, they're at Twitter, they're at Facebook, they're at Google. They're, they are the middle management. They are the ones running the show. It is not the CEOs. It is this massive corpus of an elite group of people who graduated and have views that are anathema to human liberty. Now, how are we gonna get past that? With enormous difficulty because you now have in the most important positions of power, which is the middle management. They're the ones who accuse people of sexual harassment. They're the ones who basically can determine whether or not they want to boot people from the executive suite. And they are now in positions of control in massive oligarchies, uh, whether it's the media or the entertainment industry or the tech industry. Now, how to fix universities? It's not going to be the market. That's my I, position. I, I, I actually think the issue of the university is sort of irrelevant because this is all beginning in first grade, second grade, third grade, fifth grade. And the real conversation has to do with creating an environment where teachers are respected and teachers respect the student. I mean, that's the pedagogical question is trust. Trust in the classroom, trust in the process, even when one disagrees. But it, by the time they're getting to college, it's, and we're not having the conversation at that level because that's really what's driving the problem. Just to jump in on this, um, I think there's an even more fundamental issue that uh, we need to be getting at, and that is the search and the discovery processes that lead to truth. We've had a society that for uh, several centuries has operated under the principle that we don't know truth, we don't have access to all aspects of truth, but we do seek to value it and we seek to discover it. Uh, the last few decades, I see a very alarming trend of turning against that, of uh, not advancing the pursuit of knowledge for truth, but advancing the pursuit of knowledge for various activist agendas. 
I use this as a point of comparison. Around the year 2000, there was a historian by the name of Michael Belial that wrote a book called The Arming America that was awarded uh, the Bancroft Prize, the top uh, prize in the history profession by many regards. He had falsified information and data in his book, and it was discovered very easily. He had uh, used it to make a political point, and it turned out the records he had cited and purported to quote from uh, did not exist. And then he, he came up with all these crazy excuses. He claimed that there had been a fire and a flood in his office that destroyed the records when no one could find them. The prize was rescinded. Fast forward 20 years, take something like the 1619 Project in the New York Times. Similar falsifications for a political agenda, even down to the point that they altered the text of their article on the website to remove controversial claims and hide them from the public. They changed what they were presenting as truth. They were awarded the Pulitzer Prize and are now celebrated as a, uh, a, a top intellectual project at America's universities. That's a very rapid uh, decline in the respect, even among people of a different political persuasion, for uh, the importance of pursuing truth in the academy. How do we regain that? Well, it's a return to basic principles of inquiry. Truth and then humility and understanding what it means. You're just making my point. Uh, you're making my point. And, and that, that the people that are pursuing that at the New York Times are the people that graduated between yeah. 1987 and the year 2014. And those are the very people that are, uh, truth does not matter anymore. It does not matter to these folks. What matters is winning in politics. What ma and by politics, I don't just mean electoral politics. What matters is defeating the enemy because they are pursuing their ideological views with such religious zeal that anything and everything is acceptable. There are, there are no rules in this battle. So the idea that, oh, well, we have to go for truth, it's like very well. Um, they're not going to fight with the same tools. Uh, how, I don't believe that it's going to be universities that are going to take us back to truth. I, I, I believe that taking us back to truth is going to be having to provide some, I mean, this is not an answer to the question. We're, we're I guess, going into a, a more meta debate, so I'll, I'll actually <laughs> end that there. But I, I, I think going back to first principles is a lovely phrase. Can you please like put some meat on that and tell us what you mean by that. How do you go back to first principles? How do you bring that back, bring the search for truth back in a way that actually works? And I'd like to just jump into to maybe sound a more optimistic note, because I think that the flip side of all the negative trends, and I don't want to discount how illiberal our opponents are and how influential they are in certain circles, but I think that for a long time we had that metaphor of the, the frog being slowly boiled, so not many people were waking up to the problem that Thor was wrestling with in the early 2000s at fire and so on. But the, the great uh, uh, side effect of the horrible pandemic that we've been living through is that more people have encountered what their children are learning. I think that that happens in the remote schooling, where many of us were peering over our, our daughter's uh, shoulders and, and seeing what they're actually forced to, to listen to in uh, the public schools that exist in the, in the US. And I think that as cancel culture has become more um, uh, uh, pervasive and, and just more outrageous on college campuses, you have more alumni that used to give to their alma mater unthinkingly realizing that they cannot support something that is destructive to the basic values of a free society. And what I would want to say is maybe that sometimes we have a tendency to imagine the numbers of real zealots that exist in the cancel culture space. Uh, we, we overestimate them. And I think that our great opportunity is that there are many people who remain committed to the pursuit of truth who we can win over now. And that well, the great opportunity that I see at UFM is that uh, all of you are such honest brokers of this conversation um, that uh, it's really that the time that we need more of the groups um, affiliated with the Liberty Movement, affiliated with UFM to be very visible and show that there is a way back from the, the, the dangerous extremes that we see. Excellent. Uh, we have a question here for Lenore. In what way are the four virtues that you mentioned related to the ethical principles in UFM's mission? What are those ethical principles? Well, this is supposed to be a conversation, so Thor, you take the first one, Brad, you take <laughs> one. Those are hard questions. Um, 
the the um, I think that they are uh, related ethically, um, intellectually, uh, legally. I tried to touch on all those points. Constitutions deal with our legal principles and what what we believe and how we constitute uh, legal systems and moral questions are ethical questions and moral courage is required. Uh, you, can't, you can't just study morality in, in a jar or in, a, in theory. You have to get out and practice it and see how it shapes your choices and, and those are hard questions. And so we believe in prudence and judgment. So I think they're deeply um, connected to, to the virtues in the mission statement and I tried to draw out those connections. Maybe there's a doctoral dissertation somewhere in there, but. Um, I probably won't write that next week. <laughs> Thank you for the question, though. We have, we have a comment here. It's not a question, and it's it got a good deal of votes. This is from PD Lips. <laughs> I think UFM stands for freedom. Awesome. I like it. Very good. Um, Lawson, uh, your talk was awesome. Also on anarchy. Don't you think that anarchism expands our mind and eventually the Overton window? Uh, I think that just made my point. Um, first of all, in, I, I can't see anybody out there, but if I could, I would say, and how many know, you know what the Overton window is? And my suspicion is in this room there'd be a few hands being raised. If I was to go home and walk down to the local grocery market and stand there and raise my hand and say, does anybody know about the Overton window? Not a single person would raise their hand. And by the same token, if I said, who wants to be an anarchist, they're going to look at me and think, you don't have enough hair to be an anarchist. Um, I think, you know, the conversations about the study of anarchism has a role to play in the study of institutions. Um, it is technically a form of governance, if one would believe, because, it, uh, and the, but the lack of government is not, again, the lack of institutions. Now, we understand the nuance of that. We understand that the word anarcho-capitalism actually exists in the language um, for 0.0002% of the population. Um, and I think that's actually the problem, is that how do you have a conversation with the average person on the street about anarchism, anarchy? Now, that being said, I do believe that this current generation, generations, I'm going to say, which I'm going to include myself in that, the divides that we have seen in the last 18 months because of COVID are less about political ideology than about the idea of risk. There are people who are naturally inclined to take risks. There are those who are not. It does not matter what one's political beliefs. I have a neighbor who is far more progressive than I am, who has a very strong risk-taking a feeling about things and somebody else is the opposite. And my point is that there is a little bit of a feeling of we are in an, an anarchy of sorts right now. Mm -hmm. And so perhaps now is actually to have a time on that conversation of what is anarchy. It's not just anti-government, it's the challenge of institutions. So there may be something to be said for having that. I just think the problem is doing that in a mainstream way is particularly challenging. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have a question for Phil. If the government controls funding of universities, wouldn't that be like the road to serfdom applied to universities? Bingo. That's exactly what's going on. Uh, I've argued for a while that we should view higher education, at least the publicly funded portion of it, as we would view any large government program, agency, or bureaucracy. It is something that is invested in by tax dollars that are taken through uh, forcible appropriation and they're politically allocated. Now, higher ed often operates under high-minded uh, principles and self-projection of what it's doing, advancing knowledge in society, training the next generation, equipping young people with uh, the tools they need to go out into the workforce. But if you strip back that rhetoric and you look behind it, it's really just a, um, a massive publicly funded bureaucracy. And as a publicly funded bureaucracy, it's subject to the same forms of corruption, the same forms of interest group manipulation, uh, the same forms of political capture that we see in any other large-scale institution of that nature. Uh, higher ed is closer to the Department of Motor Vehicles than it is to a, uh, a lofty ivory tower that's bestowing wisdom on society. And it's gotten worse in that direction. Uh, the question is, when does it collapse under the weight of its own bureaucracy? In other words, when do taxpayers pull the plug? 
Brad, do you want to expand on yeah, that? I was going to weigh in because um, when I was writing the, this uh, recent book, one of the things I looked at were some of the famous presidential warnings that were given at the end of presidential terms when they, they tend to um, do a, a farewell address. And many people know that Eisenhower warned, warned of um, the development of the military industrial complex, but rereading it, it's really interesting that his critique is much broader. It's really about government funding of all sorts of research institutions, institutions including higher ed, and he sort of foresaw that there's something that's really damaging to the idea of a republic if you wind up with this um, uh, intermingling between big government interests and uh, the sort of technological scientific elite. One of the things that I think, again, speaks to an opportunity for us is that one of the lessons of the pandemic has been that our expert class it tends to be very often wrong and that a lot of what has worked over the past 18 months has been um, thanks to the resilient efforts that come from communities and many of the problems have been about top-down directives that have um, uh, been found wanting, that they, they, they haven't been, um, uh, there hasn't been a whole lot of foresight in some of those. So I think that again, for, for those of us who um, realize we don't need to convince everybody to, um, to, to, to name an auditorium after uh, Hayek and so on, but we do need them to understand that um, knowledge is dispersed and that societies can repair themselves better when we don't put all of our eggs in one basket. These are lessons I think lots of people can understand and it's a big opportunity for us to change the narrative these days. Mm -hmm. We have a question for Thor. How can we take helicopter parenting down now? I guess the best way is to show, lead by example. I think that's probably uh, the most effective way and to um, maybe identify successful people who can talk about this mm -hmm. and, and, and the differences. And I, I don't want to sound like some old person, but many of you in this room remember the era pre-cell phones, remember the era of no seat belts, remember the era of driving in the back of a pickup truck, remember the era of eating mud, remember the era of, and you know, I mean, it makes for a nice meme when you read it, and, and, and you read about, oh yeah, back there in the good times, but the reality is, you know, people dealt with stuff, and they were, in many ways, more adjusted. That doesn't mean that we also shouldn't be sensitive, and that it is actually not a good idea to create little narcissists <coughs> by telling people that they shouldn't have feelings, and shouldn't have compassion and shouldn't have empathy. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of people on the right side of the spectrum that go toward that because they actually fail to have empathy and compassion. So I, I, th I think there needs to be like, you know, we, we, we need to rethink and re-engineer a lot of things around parenting, especially now in a, in a technological era. Um, and so I, um, I really also have the issue that I don't yet have children. So I don't have the issue of helicopter. I'm just having to deal with your children um, and, and the consequences of what your children are gonna do to the place where I live, the United States, which I see in a horrendous decline. And I, uh, you know, there, where, are, where are we going to go? Um, and, and there really is no option or alternative at this point because dictatorships, once they have um, military superiority over the United States, the fight for freedom is over. It's simply just a few grains of sand in the hourglass that are going to empty out as every nation that remains free will slowly become either a populist democracy or a fully-fledged dictatorship. So, I mean, I'm definitely in a rage against the dying of that light, but I think that a, a lot needs to be done. And if we cannot save the United States, um, there is no hope for Guatemala or really anywhere else. The record mud is actually quite good. Um, I still eat it regularly. Um, but I would just add, as, as one who has sort of completed at least certain phases of parenting, that I do think at the end of the day, parents to parents are one of the greatest peer networks because when one becomes a parent, that natural fear that you may or may not have comes to light in a particularly horrendous way. And because you're going down the rabbit hole of social media and looking for this, it only feeds that fear, which again, back to the question of create individuals who have the ability to think critically and to take a pause and not overreact and to be confident of who they are rather than simply be reflective of what they see about them. And that's a hard thing 
to do, but at the end of the day, you have conversations with more parents who are less helicopter parenting than they think, but they also believe that's what they're supposed to do because they don't have that ability to be confident of who they are and what they are and to make judgment calls, mm -hmm. and that's the underlying problem. Mm -hmm. We are gonna have to close with one last question, and this is for Lenore. How can we apply UFM virtues in our everyday life? Start. <laughs> I think that's the best option, to, just to start. And I, wanna, I wanted to just conclude quickly with a challenge to Thor, which we can discuss over lunch, I hope. I don't know, you said you don't think that the market can solve the problem, but I don't know what else we have. So I think it's this creativity, it's the one-on-one -on -one conversations, and it's, it's the, the option to create alternative systems, and I believe UFM represents what we might call patient capital. And I, I think if you went back and, and looked at what was created 50 years ago today, it, you can change the world through the market, and you can change it through organizations that are operating through market principles. And I, I challenge you to find another institution that can solve the problem, Thor. Excellent. So thank you very much to all the speakers. Uh, thank you very much all for being here. Muchas gracias a todos.